Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Well, thanks for joining us on the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast today. We're joined by Robert Delius, his Associate Director, Architect and Head of Sustainability at Stride Triglown. Um, and if you don't know what Stride Triglown does, uh, Robert's going to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put lots of links on the uh, spiel that goes with the podcast, so make sure you um, have a have a read and a, and a check out. But one of the things that I really like is the strap line for Stride Triglown says it's maximising biodiversity through design. And for me, biophilic design does exactly that. It helps maximise that biodiversity messaging. The Stride Triglown have done so many things, and it's a, it's a, it's a humongous cut. Uh, um, company but I know you yourself have done loads of fantastic projects so we're going to talk about various things today um, but first of all Robert can you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, a bit about your company and, um, and a bit about what you do there please. Yeah well thanks so much to um, invite me along to this nurse it's a real privilege to be on this podcast. Um, so my um, I'm Rob Delius and I'm head of sustainability for Stride Clown. We're a multidisciplinary practice and we, we concentrate on architecture. We're an architecture practice essentially, but we're about the 10th largest in the UK. Um, but we also have landscape architects, interior designers. So we're covering lots of different aspects. Um, and because of our size, we tend to do larger projects, um, which I, I like being involved in large projects because it means we can have really big impact. We're not doing sort of one-off houses. It means we're transforming potentially whole landscapes, whole communities, creating whole new places. Uh, so that's what really excites me about being um, part of a company of this sort of size. And a bit more about us, we're um, a B Corp. Um, so we're the, um, the first architect practice in the top 100 to become a B Corp. And if if you're not sure what that is or haven't come across that before, it's it's about uh, companies signing up to balance purpose and profit. So to do have positive impact in everything they do in, in terms of communities they're working with, through the projects they're involved with, through their staff, et cetera. Um, and yeah, we, 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 we kind of... Uh, do, do all sorts of building types. My background is mainly um, in kind of residential and master planning. Um, and I've been our head of sustainability for about 12 years now. Okay. Well, talk, talking of sustainability and your role there, obviously head of sustainability, what what sort of was the, the sort of thing that took you into sustainability? And I mean, were you always connected to nature or? Um... Yeah, I think, well, funnily enough, Growing up, I, I never really thought of being an architect. It, I mean, buildings actually, funnily enough, didn't really uh, inspire me or, or um, have much connection to me. No one in my family had had any sort of building connection. But as you say, um, I was always very interested in nature. Um, my parents were keen kind of bird watchers and gardeners. And, and I think... I had a bit of a crisis of confidence when I, I took a year out before going into university to study architecture. And um, I worked in Australia and I worked on some tree nurseries, on some farms and things. And I really kind of was wondering, we've got enough buildings and I don't really want to design buildings. And But I sort of drifted into it because I always liked art as well. Um, but actually, I kind of concluded that it's, it's not a bad thing that um, I'm not, you know, all about buildings and and the built environment because I I enjoy much more the the kind of the wider community landscape biodiversity aspect of it. I think that's really positive and I think that's definitely the way architecture and placemaking design is very much going. It's not just about buildings, it's about all of those things. So having an interest in that I think is a positive. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, before we uh, kind of go into the thing, I, I have to talk about your name. <laughs> when we first spoke, I was like, "Oh, Delius." Oh, and I thought I will ask you. Then I thought, "No, I won't ask you." And then I saw on your on your bio biography on Stride Triglown website, I saw that you were actually related to Frederick Delius, the composer. Um, I mean, for me, music and nature are just like the things that make life worth living. You know, it's like they just spread that make your soul happy. Um, and I know you feel the same. 
Um, I mean, maybe you could just tell us just a little bit about the kind of arts and culture and nature and all that sort of interconnectivity. Yeah, I mean, as you say, um, Frederick Delius is uh, he's, he's something like a, my great grandfather's uncle or something. And, and he was an English composer who was different from his counterparts in that he was very inspired by nature. Um, and if you look at all of his pieces, they've all got kind of natural themes to it. And um, he also loved travel. And um, again, I, I'm kind of in that same bracket. I love nature and travel. And although I haven't gone into a kind of musical direction, um, I hope I can make a difference and communicate nature through my work as as a designer in, in, a, in a different way. So I... Me, Kind of music, nature, and travel is, is are the sort of things which really um, inspire me, um, and I guess uh, specifically in architecture, it's kind of about living in harmony with nature, and, and that's kind of the angle that I've really worked out is the thing that I'm really interested in, is how can we form a, a much closer connection between buildings and between nature, so that they're not seen as separate things, but they're more completely connected you know I think traditionally they've always been you've got architects who do the buildings then you've got landscape architects who do everything outside and there's not been much kind of cross fertilization so that's my mission is to sort of bring that together that's great and, and biophilic design again to sort of plug that but it but it really does do that doesn't it it got, does connect the two I mean for Absolutely, you yeah. yeah do you which elements of biophilic design do you see as being like the most beneficial for, um, you know, to help architects and designers really, I suppose, um, really bring that nature connection back so that places are more sustainable. I, Sorry, that's, 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 the, that's yeah. the key thing. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, I mean, biophilic design really resonates with me as well. And I always look on my projects and I'm encouraging my colleagues as well to, uh, introduce as many opportunities as possible for planting in designs and whether that's externally internally trying to reduce the amount of hard space introduce soft and i think by forging a closer connection to the natural world that's obviously extremely good for our well-being it's good for the planet it's good for nature um, so that's like a really key aspect and i think when we can't necessarily introduce uh nature into our buildings internally we we can use natural forms as well and um use those kind of elements of nature i mean for example um in our bath office here which is where i work out of in the last year we've we've actually filled the office with plants um, and it's just had a completely transformative effect on on what was a fairly dull office before and, and everyone you know loves it now and can't imagine it without these big plants yeah. um and we've also in our main boardroom we did i i did with a with a colleague a mural of a of a kind of branch structure a sort of silhouette um, and, and that's now the backdrop to our our boardroom. And it, it's just that kind of natural pattern that you get from the branches just creates such a great backdrop to that space. And it also reminds us that we should always be thinking about nature in, in, in all our projects and all our decisions. But those those kind of elements are the ones I really kind of hone in on in, in terms of biophilic design. Yeah, that's, that's really it's really good to hear. And I heard you say the words were, um soft space yeah I, I guess for me um having worked on a lot of residential schemes I get quite frustrated by how much space we take up for roads and yeah. give over to parking and 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 cars and, and quite often it's a struggle with with um highways um and uh people from the council and whoever who are sort of insisting road carriageways must be this amount of width and you know before you know it the 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 project is just very hard you've got a little bit of strip left over for greenery at the edge um you've got a sort of designated strip pavement for for people to walk on and it's it just it just feels all the balance is is wrong and we we've had some really good projects where we've managed to kind of twist that around and really challenged how much 
hard space is needed for cars and try to create a the the hopefully the sort of environments we all want to be living in which are much more soft and full of plants and much more people focused yeah absolutely it's where it's what we're where we're, where we're happiest is, isn't it it's our na it's our natural environment excuse the pun um we're going to be talking about yeah. um a few of those projects in a sec but um biodiversity net gains legislation has come in and um morgan taylor from green gauge touched on it um in, in an earlier podcast but for you do you um can you tell us just um again just for people who are listening just a little bit about what that is how do you feel this is going to impact how we build in the future is it enough is it a step in the right direction is it clear Are, is it clear what it's... people are supposed to do <laughs> I, I think it's exactly what you just said. It's a step in the right direction. I think when you think about it, the statutory uh, requirement is a 10% improvement, which is not very yes. aspirational. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what we're doing as a practice is, as a minimum, we're trying to push our, all our clients to go for 25%. Amazing. Um, so that's something we're going to start to to roll out on all, all of our projects. Um, it. It also, um, I mean, if, if you think we should be actually using brownfield land most of the time anyway, so it's going to be easier to get a higher percentage on brownfield land, um, although, although there are a few derelict sites which actually have fairly good biodiversity because they've been left alone for a long time. But generally, if, we, if we're targeting brownfield sites, there's no reason why we shouldn't be going much higher. And my concern is that, the less scrupulous developers will see 10 percent as a target mm -hmm. and they'll do what they can to get to that rather than think it is being a minimum mm -hmm. so we, we should be targeting much higher than that yeah exactly it should you say it should be a minimum that's how it should be um i don't quite know what the wording is i need to need to read it um properly i must admit i skimmed it i don't know it always seems to get sort of watered down doesn't it it kind of is a good idea it goes yeah. through legislation it goes through parliament it goes through about 15 million different hands and then it's like when you're organizing a party isn't it if one person organizes it or three maybe then it might be a good one but afterwards it's organized by a committee and it ends up being a disaster so um you know this sort of biodiversity net gains legislation seems to be it's quite similar really <laughs> well it's, it's as you said it's it's definitely a step in the right direction i mean there is the, the kind of get out clause that um, developers can actually introduce that requirement on another site nearby, a designated site. So they don't even have to do it on their yeah. plot, um, which is disappointing. Um, but it does mean that some of the improvements will be going into creating really kind of biodiversity hotspot areas, which is great. Um, but what we really want is it to be everywhere really that there's no kind of um e even on a tight urban site you can be looking at your roof you can be introducing green walls etc so there are there are ways around doing it yeah um it's, it's almost like it's um you sort of go into uh confession booth isn't it you can go and do what you want to do and then you go into confession booth so well it's okay fine i've just planted 10 percent over there so that's okay <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah um, I, obviously, I know Stride Triglown has um, completed loads of uh, sustainable projects. Um, is there one that stands out for you that might be an example for best practice? So if there's someone listening or an aspirational, maybe even a student architect or something that just wants to look at how it should be done, or it could be done. Um, uh, is there one that you would like to kind of just highlight for us? Yeah, yeah, it's pro probably one that I was involved with. Um, so I was project architect for one quite quite a few years ago, actually. It was probably back in about 2008, which is probably one of my proudest projects. So it's quite old now. But um, when, when it was completed, it had an awful lot of media attention. Um, and it was sort of named in a study as the most energy efficient scheme in the UK. Oh, yeah. um so it was it was quite an accolade um and so the project is called great Boyard, and it's in somerset obviously the its kind of environmental performance has, has been well exceeded by other schemes now which is great um but it took a very holistic um approach to creating a sustainable project um it, it's not a very big project it's a housing project 
And um, the thing, as well as having very high aspirations for environmental performance, um, one of the things, the defining things about the project is that there's two terraces around a central uh, shared garden. And that was always kind of quite a key part of the design. Um, and we went back last year to speak to the residents to see how 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 it all is now and, and how it's gone on and talk about the kind of um, how the, the houses are performing. But the thing actually which came through most strongly from all those discussions, as well as them loving in loving these kind of low energy houses, which was good for their bills, etc. It was the shared garden, which was the most mm. powerful out of everything. It just the sense of community it created between them. And there's like a, they have a gardening day um, when they come out and work together. And there's like a, a little barbecue spot and it's, it's a beautiful spot. It's near a river as well. But um, I think that kind of one element was the thing, which is the really defining um feature for that project but yeah do do have a look at our website and you can find out a little bit more about that and, and also what it's looking like today it, what's great about it is that when we when we designed it um like like most projects when they're completed they're quite sort of sterile um in that the landscape's very very young and the planting but now everything seems to have colonized it and it really nestles beautifully into the setting and i love that Oh, that sounds really nice. Um, I, hopefully we'll put some pictures on the um, on the podcast page on the Journal of Biophilic Design okay, .com, um, so people can so we can illustrate the um, the article and the the um, the podcast as well when we publish it. Um, yeah, so it's called Great Bow Yard. And I love the fact as well that you, you're creating um, sociable spaces or places for people to be and to gather and to collect because a part of biophilia as well is you know while it's nature connection it's also about that connection to life and living entities and this sort of it reduces that isolation it encourages people to get together um you know in the sort of purest form of biophilia is about not just about looking at a plant it's actually about communicating with living systems and life systems um including including ourselves you know <laughs> Um, yeah, and and one one of the key things from that scheme was we managed to tuck the the parking area mm -hmm. slightly to the side so that people have to walk a little bit to their front, which means they see their neighbour, they say hello, they have a chat. You don't have the cars parked directly in front of the houses, and so therefore you immediately have a much stronger connection to the landscape and to the place rather than just looking out onto your your driveway and your car. So I think there's little things like that that a lot of other projects could be doing. Absolutely, yeah. I like I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I think why why do we always have to stick the you know the garage in the driveway in front of the the house and we just that's what we get to see is a car bonnet. You know, it's it's, it's quite exactly yeah quite yerk really yeah and it's quite yeah. Um, obviously, biophilic design we just were talking about as well which supports well being. Um, and again, we've got to talk about the sociability aspect of things. But you shared with me when we spoke a couple of weeks ago about this. I mean, I really love the idea of this is Bath well-being city. And obviously, low, people who, who know me, they'll know that I'm a real Roman nut. And I, I kind of obviously studied ancient ancient world. So I, I love anything to do with the Romans. So Bath being a Roman um, spa city. And you had, a, you had a concept. I mean, I'm not going to waffle on about this. I mean, I'd like you to kind of tell us about what, what it was, where it came about, and, and what exactly, it would, you know, what your ideas for this well-being city would be. Yeah, so as you said, um, Bath, as everyone knows, is a, is a Roman city. It's a spa city. Um, and quite a number of years ago, there was a, a competition called Imagine Bath, and I put an entry in, uh, and it was just an ideas competition for something uh, which I called Waters of Bath. And it was about um, celebrating the fact that Bath is a spa town by introducing water throughout the city and, and creating this kind of amazing sense of well-being through celebrating its kind of spa heritage. Because there's surprisingly little water in the city, which is a, um, a spa city. Um, and, and that surprisingly um won the competition and i've been kind of working on that as a, as a concept since then but it's kind of evolved 
from that idea of just thinking about water to thinking about the whole city as a well-being city because it has that um, amazing heritage of thinking about well-being so not just from the the original um, hot springs in the city but when the um, the Georgians developed the city they were actually thinking all about uh, well-being and health because essentially it was a um, as well as being a, a kind of spa town it, it was a resort really and they planned the city with wide pavements to encourage people to walk and to promenade to be outside in nature they were encouraged to to come to the city um, and what was called take the cure um, which meant sp spending time in the city promenading being outside going into all of the kind of green spaces around the city and and the the Georgian architecture uh, as well was planned with with green spaces with with st uh, street planting like tree planting so it was quite revolutionary for its time and it was all about um, creating health within the city and I thought it's great that when um, other cities are talking about being sort of embracing well-being we've got this amazing heritage within the city we should be embracing that and not just thinking about what the Romans did or what the Georgians did we should be challenging what does a 21st century well-being city look like um, so that's what really the campaign is about and, and sort of presented to the council and others about imagining the a 21st century well-being city and, and you know from play to water to green spaces to transport you know thinking about it very holistically creating this amazing uh place where people will want to live um will want to work um and and all of the economic benefits of that for the city mm -hmm. i like the idea of having a a competition that kind of helps reimagine um a space or a mm. town or a city um it gets you thinking kind of you know off the top of your head and you know this whole blue sky um blue water <laughs> thinking i think um, on, on a city scale as well yeah mm. i mean quite often we we're just talking about buildings or sites you know yeah. why not think about a whole city exactly yeah and if we can if we can get the planning right if we can actually get it like the urban design it's like if you're building a building isn't it if you can actually start right from you know thread the ideas and the concepts right from grassroots sorry about all these nature puns but um, but from the grassroots of um of a, of a project then it's more holistic everything joins up it's more sustainable it's more economic to actually build isn't it so actually being able to create something on a city-wide scale um i think it's great and again if it's okay i'll put some pictures in the um on the on the website but um listeners uh, please know that um robert has written a fantastic article on water uh, which is going to be in our uh, neurodiversity issue, which is out in May. So make sure you um, you bookmark the website, journalofbiophilicdesign.com, or buy it on Amazon, or download it on Kindle, or issue, or wherever else you um, you do your reading. Um, Stride to Glow itself uh, are really um, pushing the um, and supporting the sustainability messaging. And you had a, a sort of whole concept called the Green Week, which is is kind of now sort of transformed into into something else. Can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, it was, it was when I um, became head of sustainability for the practice. So I was just trying to think of ways to really uh, inspire and engage with staff mm. and with, with people that we're working with and came up with the concept of having a, a green week every year. And it was just an opportunity to get in some really inspiring speakers and to focus on different subjects. So each year we had a different theme. And it meant we could reach out to um, other companies as well. And, and we tried to encourage other companies to also hold Green Week. So um, in Bristol, where I was based when, when we were starting it, we actually managed to convince, uh, working with Business West as well, who, who were really on board with the idea. We, we had about 70 businesses all holding mm -hmm. Green Week at the same time. So including the universities, BBC, the council, et cetera. So it felt like something really exciting that we were all kind of talking about something which was 10, 12 years ago, still a bit of a kind of niche area, to, but now mm -hmm. sustainability is so everywhere that we felt it was the wrong message these days to be just saying we're going to focus on it for one week of the year so now we've we've kind of uh stopped that 
um, a couple of years ago, and we now do a thing called Wednesday 15, which is a weekly uh, seminar. Um, and we have a, have a talk. We, we talk about a particular theme or, or look at a particular project, and it's an opportunity for um, us internally to kind of look at what we're doing and share um, or we get in guest speakers. So it's it's constantly a subject that we're talking about. Um, and it's only 15 minutes long because we're all so busy. <laughs> Everyone is these days. We've, there's too much information on everything that it's just trying to condense it into a very um, digestible format. That's a great idea. It's a really great idea, as you say, you know, starting from a green week, which was like, you know, before everybody was saying it really and talking about it to now actually almost it being the heartbeat of your of a week, which is brilliant, like a little sort of 15 totally. minute hit of like, yeah, and keeping yeah. you going, keeping that inspiration going, doesn't it? It's all positive messaging and things. So um, the, the, I'm going to I want to talk about the other um, activist projects that you've done um, yourself. Um, there's one that you it's called The Sinking House. Um, which was a message of warning and hope. And it was obviously done during the COP26, which obviously seemed like a long time ago now, but it wasn't. It was only two two COPs ago, but um, and lots of happened in between. But could you um, tell us about the concept, please, um, what you were aiming to do, what it looked like as well? Because obviously this is an audio um, podcast, so maybe you could explain that. Challenge number 605. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so the... the... <clears throat> As you said, it was it was coming up to COP26, and we we wanted to do something that was going to be really visually engaging and get people aware of the fact that what COP26 was, COP was, and that it was actually happening in the UK this year, so which was in Glasgow, and we were inspired by uh, Greta's speech, which was saying our house is on fire. And also in the same year, there were a lot of floods happening in Europe where people were stranded on um, on the roofs of their houses. And you've also got that kind of classic climate change image of the polar bear being sort of stranded on the iceberg. So we kind of brought all that together and um, thought about this idea of floating a kind of mock-up of a house in the river in this in central bath um and putting a figure on it sort of stranded but hanging on to this kind of lifeline um which would stop it sort of being um taken away down the river and, and the 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 house was um sort of semi-submerged it was sinking and it was we painted it bright red a bit like a monopoly house if you imagine that kind of sunk in the in, in the river um so we placed it in a really central location which is um near Pulteney bridge which is a very iconic um you know it's a grade one listed bridge and we knew it would be um kind of recognizable as a view sort of around the world and, th and that's that was the point of it was to get that message about climate change um as, as wide as possible and the message about um to the leaders attending cop that that person on the top was holding on to a lifeline and that lifeline spelt out COP26 in big letters and it was attached to the bridge. So it was a very visual piece um, and we couldn't quite believe we actually got permission to create this kind of almost life-size house in the river in such a kind of sensitive location. But it it, it was actually, well, it was great fun making it and it was really um, uh really successful in that so many people saw it and talked about it and people still talk about it today but not just that but um we worked out it probably was seen by um well well over a million people on social media plus it was covered all around the world in terms of that iconic image which is just kind of exactly the message we wanted just to get that message out there about climate change so i suppose using our our kind of imaginations and skills as, as kind of architects and creators to create something which is not just talking about a subject but creating an image that can resonate and people can remember and talk about which I think there's a real power to there, there can be some there can be some sort of isolation I suppose as well in in terms of people you know fearing climate change and not knowing what to do and we want these discussions are out in the open and then you combine that with the solutions you know, like positive architecture and, and sort of sustainability and, and companies trying to hit their biodiversity net gains, it sort of, it gets, it puts, it puts 
it puts nature um in the boardroom doesn't it really ultimately that's what it yeah. does we wanted to do something that, yeah. that was going to be um understandable to everyone from mm. older people to children as well so mm. when, when you're talking about things in words you know it's often harder to communicate the message but people can kind of understand what the image what the thing was trying to say you know from from quite a young age so that was the the objective no it's really it's really good um and it's probably something that should be wheeled out again actually i mean people keep building on floodplains um i just just had a conversation last week with um with robert gardner um and he was he was talking about the whole thing about why are we still building on floodplains <laughs> you know it's like yeah. it's not it's, it's crazy why are people doing it you know there's going to be more flooding so yeah that's a good idea when is it a good idea? Anyway, um, yeah, I just <laughs> so um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So before I go to the final question, is there anything else that you'd like to add? I mean, there's loads of questions I could ask you about architecture and biophysical design, and maybe we're going to have to do another one because we're going to have to do something linked to water, particularly as well. So, but that's that's going to be podcast number two. Just to forewarn you, okay. that, I'm sure you, you, I'm sure you can't wait. Sounds uh, good. <laughs> uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add before I ask my final question well probably just to flag up I'm, I'm not sure when this podcast will go out but um, we were sort of inspired by what we did for, with Sinking House which was about climate change I was also really keen always to do something about nature um, and highlight the, the kind of ecological crisis and the fact that we are um, one of the most nature depleted countries in the world the uk is and i don't think that's widely known but it was sort of reported in a, a state of nature report last year so we're doing uh, a similar kind of using art and and kind of visual references to create a really big um a big deal again in bath and it's we're creating an event called a funeral for nature and we're working with a um a group called the Red Rebels, and they they dress in this kind of really amazing otherworldly sort of red robe kind of attire, and we've got almost four hundred of them will be walking through the centre of Bath um, in a few weeks, and it's a mock funeral procession. So there's going to be a um, a coffin stage, and we're working with Dan Pearson Studio, who who are the really renowned landscape designers, to create this beautiful visual kind of centerpiece, which is all about nature and and um, just trying to be provocative and say that you know we're it's in a bad place at the moment, and we need to be doing everything we can to kind of um, to recover the kind of the species decline issues so managed to look at our our website which is um, code red for nature uk if this um, event happened by then you might see some amazing pictures of what took place then and also we're, we're working with a, a company in bristol called omni productions to create a great sort of short film about it as well so keep an eye out for that so i encourage people to go to the website code red for nature dot uk uh, to have a look, um, sign up, get involved. Um, I presume people can come along on the day, or do you have to sign up beforehand, or what's the what's the plan? Yeah, so so it's happening on twentieth of April. Um, so I'm not sure if this will have gone out by then, but um, you can definitely get involved, um, either dressing in red, or you can um, become a, a mourner and dress in black and join the back of the procession. We've got Chris Packham as well coming along, so that's really exciting, and obviously a huge nature campaigner. Um, so it should be um, it should be really mo moving and powerful, but also a great experience for everyone to be involved with. Yeah, amazing. Well, I hope to come along as well. So um, hope to see you there. Um, so final question, Robert: If you could paint the world with a magic brush of biophilia, what would it look like? I think for me, the the image I have in my head is like a garden. So. Um, I think that's kind of what inspires me and what I'm trying to do with a lot of my projects is kind of create that almost um, sense of an Eden where buildings and landscape sort of come together and it, there's this kind of feeling of abundance where um, there's green and there's nature and birdsong and insect life and 
trying to create that in, in our projects, which I know is always a challenge. Um, but that that's what I see um, the kind of how we can then get biophilia kind of into our projects and in, in creating that kind of sense of Eden. Thank you for listening to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast.